As the young Polish officer languished in Marblehead, Massachusetts, a small seaside town near Boston, he grew frustrated as the Continental Congress hesitated to grant him a commission. Him! A hero of the War of the Bar Confederation who had fought defiantly against the subjugation of his homeland. Exasperated, he wrote to George Washington directly, declaring, I came here, where freedom is being defended, to serve it and to live or die for it. Washington was sympathetic to the Polish patriot and invited him to join his staff until he formally received his commission from Congress. Four days before his commission arrived, at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11th, 1777, as the Continental Army began to collapse, the Polish officer reported to Washington that the British were attempting to entrap his forces. Seeing little other choice, Washington ordered him to round up as many scattered troops as he could and along with his mounted bodyguard, hold the British off long enough for the rest of the army to withdraw. This he did, launching a daring charge into the British line, which temporarily halted their advance. This near-suicidal charge allowed not only the battered remnants of the Continental Army, but George Washington himself to escape the field and live to fight another day. But who was this man who had crossed an ocean to fight and ultimately give his life for the cause of freedom? His name was Casimir Pulaski, the father of the American cavalry. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Casimir Pulaski was born Casimirez Michal Wadleslaw Wiktor Pulaski on March 6, 1745, in a manor house in Warsaw. He was the middle of three sons to Josef Pulaski and Mariana Zilienska. Pulaski was born into a life of comfort. His family had been members of the Polish nobility for generations. His father was a prominent governmental and military figure serving as the elder of Warsaw, a small town near Warsaw, a member of the Crown Tribunal, the highest appellate court in the Kingdom of Poland, and as a member of the Polish Parliament. Young Casimir grew up attending the elite Collegium Nobilium, literally, the college for nobles, but he did not graduate. At the school, however, Pulaski received a somewhat atypical education for someone of his status. Rather than focusing on the classics like Greek and Latin, the school emphasized philosophy, politics, natural sciences, and mathematics. The school was designed to prepare the next generation of Polish-Lithuanian nobility to run the country. At the Collegium, Casimir was introduced to the ideas of the Enlightenment. By the time he was 17, Casimir had begun his military education as a page at the court of the Duke of Courland. As a page, Casimir began training in the art of war, learning combat techniques, swordsmanship, and how to ride a horse. At the same time, his father appointed him the Starost of Zezulinche. In 1764, when he was just 19, he cast a vote alongside his family to elect the new Polish monarch Stanislaw Antoni Poniatowski. His father had always instilled in his boys a strong nationalist sentiment. When Russia came to heavily dominate the Commonwealth through the new king, the elder Pulaski became one of the founding members of the Bar Confederation, an organization of disgruntled Slatcha who sought to curtail Russian hegemony over Poland. Young Casimir quickly joined the Confederation alongside his father. By February 29, 1768, he had cobbled together a cavalry unit and pledged himself to the Confederation, being appointed a colonel under his father. Now, we have talked a bit about the complex political, cultural, and military situation in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at this time in our episode on Tadeusz Kajusko, so we won't go into much more detail here. 
Instead, we're going to take a brief look at Casimir's service during the War of the Bar Confederation to try and understand him as a soldier. Just remember that Casimir's service during the Bar Confederation was far more extensive than we'll have time to go into here. We encourage you to research the topic further if you want a better understanding. Casimir quickly developed a reputation as one of the rebellion's best commanders, leading his men in improbable victories at Pohorele and Starokostyanskiniv. He also led his men to defeat at Kachanauka, Kmielnik, and finally Berdichiv, where he was captured by Russian forces. After renouncing his pledge that he would not return to action, which were the terms of his release, he served admirably for the next three years, fighting no less than 13 battles and gaining an international reputation as a skilled and brave fighter. Despite regularly disobeying or flat-out disregarding his superior's orders, he was appointed as a general in the Confederation's armies and appointed to the War Council of the Bar Confederation in March 1771. But what allowed Pulaski to climb through the ranks so quickly, eclipsing even his father in the Confederation's hierarchy? Certainly not his physique. Standing just five feet, one inch tall, the short, frail, and thin Casimir was not an imposing figure. He was, however, described by several contemporaries as spontaneous, more proud than ambitious, and a loose cannon. Also imperious, he was a hothead who was far too brave for his own good. His penchant for action and his desire to be in the thick of the action cost him several battles because he could not effectively command his troops. His bravado, however, was much admired. He was a cavalryman through and through who preferred a bold charge against all else. The beginning of the end for Pulaski came when he agreed to go along with an attempt to kidnap King Stanislaw. Even though the conspirators planned not to harm the king, it became an international scandal when it got leaked. The French and Austrians, under foreign pressure, withdrew their support for the Confederation. By the end of May 1772, Pulaski was forced into exile in Silesia, part of Prussia, as the Confederation, lacking its foreign benefactors, began to collapse under pressure from all sides. By 1773, Pulaski was in France, trying and failing to join the French army. At the same time, he was declared a regicide, someone guilty of the purposeful killing of a monarch or sovereign by the Russian-dominated partition Sajim. The king himself warned Pulaski that he could not come home. By July 1773, he was formally sentenced to death and had all his lands confiscated. Undeterred, he briefly tried to rebuild the Confederation in exile to serve under the Ottomans in the Russo-Turkish War, but the conflict ended before the unit was ready. By the time he returned to France, he was deeply in debt, sentenced to death in his homeland, and unemployed. He was occasionally imprisoned for those debts. His prospects seemed bleak until the spring of 1777 when he was introduced to Benjamin Franklin. Franklin already knew who Pulaski was. Despite being just 32, Pulaski was regarded as one of the best commanders of the Bar Confederation. He was also rightly seen as a soldier who fought for the ideas of liberty and freedom, something that set him apart from his contemporaries. Franklin quickly dispatched Pulaski to the United States, writing to George Washington that Count Pulaski of Poland, an officer famous throughout Europe for his bravery and conduct in defense of the liberties of his country against the three great invading powers of Russia, Austria, and Prussia, may be highly useful to our service. Pulaski set sail in June and arrived at Marblehead on July 23, 1777. After writing Washington his intentions, Pulaski set out to meet him. He arrived at Washington's headquarters near Philadelphia on August 20th. During the following days, Pulaski demonstrated his horsemanship and talked with Washington about the superiority of cavalry over infantry. Despite his desire, Washington had no power to issue a commission directly. 
Pulaski spent the next month or so lobbying Congress directly for his commission. Before he would get it, however, would come the Battle of Brandywine. In the introduction, we already covered his exploits at Brandywine. In lieu of his accomplishments, Congress appointed him a Brigadier General on September 15, 1777. Along with this position, he was granted the honorific title, Commander of the Horse. In this position, he immediately tried to convince Congress to form a unit of lancers, cavalrymen who fought with a long spear. He also set about trying to formalize the organization and training of the American cavalry alongside Michael Kovacs, an exiled Hungarian nobleman. Now, before we continue with Pulaski's story, let's step aside briefly to discuss the state of the Continental Army's cavalry. Despite receiving the lofty title, Commander of the Horse, the Continental Army had little cavalry. Their cavalry consisted of just a few hundred lightly armed men scattered around the Continental Army in small groups. Primarily, they served as reconnaissance units. When they engaged in battle, they dismounted and fought on foot before fleeing atop their mounts. In the still professionalizing Continental Army that relied heavily on low-intensity guerrilla-style warfare, dragoons were the perfect cavalry unit. To Pulaski, however, the lightly armored and armed dragoons were not cavalry. Poland had a centuries-long tradition of heavy cavalry capable of breaking enemy formations through the sheer weight of their charge. The largest cavalry charge in history was the 18,000-man-strong charge of the Polish cavalry at the Battle of Vienna in 1683. Though it had been over 70 years since the Hussars last fought on the field, their myth of heavily armored, chivalric knights charging forward, lance leveled, would have left a massive impression on Pulaski. In Casimir's mind, cavalry should be at least moderately armed and given a wide array of weapons, including sabers, pistols, rifles, and lances. In his homeland, this was a very sensible, if perhaps a bit dated, line of thinking. However, such a grandiose vision would never be realized in the Continental Army for two main reasons. While the vast plains of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth made heavy cavalry relatively easy to deploy, North America's wooded, rugged, hilly, and swampy terrain, crisscrossed by many deep rivers, made the deployment of heavy cavalry a nightmare. However, what killed Pulaski's dream was that Congress had no money to form a professional cavalry corps. As Pulaski lobbied Congress for the creation of an expensive, heavy cavalry unit, thousands of soldiers in the Continental Army were busy freezing and starving to death at Valley Forge. An infantryman needs a place to sleep, sufficient food, clean water, medical care, a uniform, and a weapon. A unit of lancers, however, requires far more than that. If Congress could barely keep their regular soldiers alive, how on earth, they must have reasoned, could they create and maintain a unit of lancers? A cavalry unit would need to be outfitted with specially trained men and horses, both in short supply. Further, the army would have to provide for the well-being of the men and their well-trained, expensive horses. That meant gathering forage for them, building and maintaining stables, grooming, exercising, training, and providing basic medical care for the animals. Of course, all of these horses would also need to be outfitted with a saddle and stirrups. Also, a cavalryman wouldn't go into battle with just one horse. He would need several mounts, as it was pretty common for soldiers to have their horses shot out from under them. What good is a cavalryman if he's dismounted? To facilitate the transportation of the mounts to and from the battlefield, as well as care for them both on and off campaign, would require a legion of supporting troops. You don't want your expensive and irreplaceable cavalrymen tired before the battle even starts, do you? Those support troops need clothing too, food, medical care, lodging, and weapons. The cavalrymen themselves would also need far better weapons than the average infantryman. Not only would they need a musket, but also a pistol or two as well. 
They'd need at least two sabers in case one got lost during the fury of combat. Also, don't forget a few lances, preferably metal-tipped. If the British, the largest empire in the world, could only afford to send two of their 16 Dragoon regiments to North America, how could the Continental Army raise and maintain a significant force of Dragoons, let alone Lancers? As brave as he may have been, Pulaski's arrogant demeanor often drew the ire of his subordinates and superiors alike. His constant calls for a Lancer unit wore heavily on the Continental Congress. His poor English also won him no friends at camp or in Congress. Despite spending the winter of 1777 to 1778 training what little cavalry the Continental Army could muster, Casimir Pulaski resigned from the Continental Army in March 1778. Although he was no longer an officer in the Continental Army, Congress accepted his request to form an independent corps with the rank of Brigadier General. This unit, Pulaski's Legion, was officially christened on March 28, 1778 in Baltimore. Free from the constraints of superior officers, Pulaski crafted his 268 men in his image. Around 60 were trained as Lancers, the rest as light infantry. Pulaski would lead his men on reconnaissance missions and in daring raids, earning the respect of both Continental and British officers alike for the high quality of his men. By the end of 1778, however, he was in hot water with Washington, as his men had begun forcefully requisitioning supplies and horses from people he suspected were loyalists. When questioned, Casimir simply replied that he hadn't received adequate funding or supplies from Congress. To try and repair his reputation, Pulaski went to New Jersey to contain Captain Patrick Ferguson's raiders based at Chestnut Neck. But Pulaski was careless and failed to post sentries around his camp. A deserter told Captain Ferguson this, and he promptly launched a nighttime raid. Over 50 of Pulaski's men were killed or captured in what has been called a massacre. After the affair at Little Egg Harbor, Pulaski received orders from Washington on February 2nd, 1779 to reinforce Major General Benjamin Lincoln at Charleston, South Carolina. Pulaski's legion arrived at Charleston on May 8, 1779, just as a force under Brigadier General Augustine Prevost prepared to lay siege on the city. Undeterred, Pulaski led his legion in a sally against the British vanguard on May 11th. Despite fighting bravely in the face of a vastly numerically superior enemy, the legion was virtually wiped out, and Pulaski was forced to retire to Charleston. This battle was in many ways characteristic of Pulaski. It was brave, sure, but it was also, in the words of one historian, ill-judged, ill-conducted, disgraceful, and disastrous. Pulaski was still too brave for his own good. That fall, a combined Franco-American force attempted to storm the British-held city of Savannah after a month-long siege. On October 9th, a detachment under the command of the Comte d'Estaing launched a major assault on the fortifications. As the first attack wave began to falter, Pulaski, the commander of the French and American cavalry, attempted to rally the men by riding straight to the front. For his gallantry, he paid with his life. He was struck by a grape shot, an anti-infantry artillery round, in the upper leg and knocked unconscious. His men carried him from the field and put him aboard the brig USS Wasp. He would die aboard the Wasp two days later on October 11th, 1779, aged just 34. For some time, it was unclear where the cavalryman was laid to rest. While initial accounts suggested he was buried at sea, the captain of the Wasp, Samuel Bullfinch, maintained he was taken to Greenwich Plantation to be buried. According to one version of events, during his grand tour of the United States, the Marquis de Lafayette laid the first stone for the Casimir Pulaski Monument in Savannah in 1825. Other accounts claim the statue was built, though, in 1854. 
While this is usually where we would end our discussion by summarizing the person's legacy, this is not where Pulaski's story ends. In 1853, the owner of the Greenwich Plantation exhumed a body purported to be Pulaski's. The body was buried again the following year under the monument in Savannah. For over a century, many people doubted whether Pulaski was actually buried under the monument. In 1996, however, a team of forensic experts sought to find out for sure. Over eight years, a team of experts concluded that the body was likely Pulaski's, as the skeleton was about the right age and the right height, showed signs of the wounds sustained by him throughout his military career, and had a defect on his left cheekbone caused by a benign tumor that was shown in his portrait. But the skeleton also had some odd features. It appeared female. The pelvic bones, facial structures, and jawline appeared predominantly female. Despite the team's inconclusive findings, the body was reburied in 2005 with full military honors. In 2019, however, the Smithsonian, which had retained a sample of bone, proved via DNA testing, that the skeleton was indeed Pulaski. Based on an analysis of its mitochondria, the Smithsonian also found that Pulaski was likely neither male nor female. He was intersex. Intersex is a term applied to people born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit the typical definitions of female or male. Although he identified as a male throughout his entire life, Pulaski's prominent role in both the War of the Bar Confederation and the American Revolution serves as a good reminder. Although the history books rarely document the lives or exploits of intersex and queer people, it doesn't mean they weren't there or played a pivotal role in defining the world that we live in today. What then is to be said about the legacy of the father of the American cavalry? While he was undoubtedly a brave warrior, many of his contemporaries hated him for his arrogance and vanity. Though he may have been a good and brave soldier, that does not necessarily make him a good commander. Every battle he commanded in the American Revolution ended in defeat. In some ways, he was a soldier from a bygone age, an advocate of heavy cavalry brandishing saber and lance in the face of withering musket and artillery fire. On the other hand, despite his birth as a nobleman, he dedicated his life to the cause of freedom and liberty. He is remembered as a hero in Poland and also in many parts of the United States. While his contributions to the cause of American independence may have been minimal at best, his legacy as a freedom fighter who laid down his life for the United States still endures. So much so that he became just the seventh person ever to be awarded honorary American citizenship by President Barack Obama on November 6, 2009, a little over 230 years after he died for the cause of freedom. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the first quartermaster general of the Continental Army and an aide to George Washington, Thomas Mifflin.